Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another online confirmation. Glad you guys are joining us. Hope you've had a good week. Hope you're staying healthy and hope things are going well with you. Every once in a while, um, for all of you who are doing online confirmation, if you would just shoot me an email or have your parents shoot me an email and just let me know that you're watching these and that you're um, answering the questions, that would be super helpful for me. I feel like you're sort of out there in the ether and I want to make sure we're sort of making a connection here. So um, before we get started, well, first let me share my screen as always so that you guys can see what I'm talking about. All right, there we go. Um, Lighthouse is again tonight at seven, so um, be sure to register before you come. There has been a really, really strong presence of confirmands and that just fills my heart. I'm so glad. So if you haven't gone yet, um, find a friend to go with. Like I said last week, it doesn't have to be a St. Andrew friend. It can be anybody. Um, find someone from your small group or your old small group um, and come. Um, it's a really great study and um, the kids are really having a good time. So if you haven't had a chance to try it, um, I would love for you to be there. All right. So last week we talked about, we started this discussion about can only one religion be true? And we're going to finish that up this week talking about the Western um, religions. But I just want to review really quickly in case you missed the lesson last week. The, the I started off by talking about this difference between truth and opinion. So there are some things in the world that are absolutely true that everyone, you know, well, maybe not everybody agrees with it, but, and the, the example I used was if Mike, if you said Michael Agnew has a beard, that would be true. He has this very big, prominent beard. If you looked at Michael and said he doesn't have a beard, you would be wrong. You could believe that he doesn't have a beard, or you could think that the beard wasn't um, really his, um, but that would be wrong. The, there is, it, there's an absolute truth that Michael has a beard. There are other times in our lives where we say things and we say that they are true when in actuality, all we are trying to express is that they are our experience or what we believe to be true. So if I say that Dr. Pepper is better than Mountain Dew and I say, oh, it's the truth. I, I, let me tell you, Dr. Pepper is definitely better than Mountain Dew. That is my truth. That is my opinion, really. It's not an absolute truth because the taste of something or if you like something or not is a subjective thing, not objective. It's not something you can prove to be true in the absolute truth sense of that word. Um, so there are times where people use that word true, but what they're really trying to say is this is their opinion or this is their experience. So I just want that subtlety is important in this discussion about different world religions, about what is really true and what is not really true. Um, so I just wanted to, to um, revisit that before we move forward. The other thing as we move through these other religions, last week we talked about Eastern religions, Buddhism and Hinduism. And um, today we're going to be talking about Western religions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. The other thing is to realize that um, while it can feel very comforting to say that all religions are true, and if that's what you want to believe, then that's great, and that's what's true for you, that's your truth. But to some extent, all of the world religions can't be true because they have such opposing viewpoints. The Eastern religions we studied last week, Hinduism and Buddhism believe in reincarnation, that you live your life and depending on if you did a lot of good things in your life or too many bad things will depend after you die, you come back into it as another in another life and what that new life is, is dependent on what all your past lives have been. If you've been a good person, you come back sort of in a better situation. If you've been a bad person, you come back in a worse situation. And the whole goal of those religions are is through these lives, you try to get rid of all of your bad karma so you can reach nirvana or perfection um, through all of these um, lives that you have. But in Western religions, in Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, they believe you only have one life. You die, and you may be resurrected or have eternal life, but you don't come back as somebody else. You always stay who you are. In a few weeks, we're going to talk about what happens when we die, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more. But those two ideas that you have reincarnation and you're born over and over versus you only have one life, you have to believe in 
both those things can't be true. So at some point you have to decide, all right, this is true. This is what I think is true. And this is what I think is not true, but they both can't be true at the same time. So that's why to some degree, as we work through this, you're going to be forced or you, you have to think about what really is true and what is not, because there are situations in these religions where their um, tenants, what they believe in, can't both be true. All right, truth is in accordance with the actual state of affairs. I covered that talking about Michael's beard. So today we're going to be talking about the three Western religions. Like I said, um, uh, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. And all of those three religions have one person in common, and that is the person of Abraham. So I wanted to include this map so you guys could see. In our Bible, in the Old Testament, way back in Genesis, it talks about Abraham. And Abraham grew up um, and lived um, some of his life um, worshiping multiple gods, the multiple gods of his original tribe. And he, he originally lived in Ur, which you can see over there on the right side of the screen. It's in modern day Iraq, um, Ur is. And one, at one, you know, one day God showed himself, revealed himself to Abraham and said, Abraham, I want you to come and follow me. And if you follow me, I will bless you. I will make you into your descendants into a great nation. And Abraham believed in God. And this is really the, the um, first time where God is establishing his chosen people, the people that he wants to have the special relationship to show the rest of the world who he is. And Abraham believed. He was the first one who said, okay, I believe. And he followed God. God took him all the way, you know, on this little path on the orange arrows. Um, he followed the rivers, actually, and came down. And where it says Canaan, that's what we consider to be, or for the Jews to be, the promised land. That's modern-day Israel. And that's where, after going to Egypt for a little while and coming back, that's where God had Abraham um, set, sort of, set his roots. That's where he had him stay. And that's where his um, family um, began to really, really grow. Um, so all of those three religions, um, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, um, can trace their roots back to Abraham. So how does that happen? Well, here is um, God promises Abraham in Genesis 12, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. So what happens is Abraham goes and he finally settles in what is now uh, modern day Israel. And um, God has promised Abraham that he's going to be made into a great nation. But what, and to be able to do that, Abraham has to have children. And he and his wife, Sarah, are getting up in age, and they do not have any children. Sarah is considered barren, um, and she has not yet had any children. But both he and Sarah believe in this promise that God has given them. But in their impatience, they decide to take matters into their own hands. Actually, this is Sarah's idea to begin with. And she tells Abraham to go and sleep with Hagar, who is her maid servant, servant um, someone who is in service to Sarah. And she says to Abraham, go sleep with Hagar. And if she becomes pregnant, I will raise her child, that child, um, as my own. And that's how we will help God fulfill this promise that you will be the father of a great nation. Abraham agrees to this plan. Not so sure how much Hagar agreed, but they do end up um, sleeping together and Hagar becomes pregnant. And while she's pregnant, she um, decides she doesn't want to have to give up her child um, to Sarah, knowing that that was sort of the plan all along. She runs away while she's pregnant. God has an encounter with her and tells her she has to go back. She goes back and she eventually has a son who God tells her to name Ishmael. And, and that is what happens. And for a good 10 or 12 years, Ishmael is the only son, the only offspring that Abraham has. But God has always, in, always intended to live up to his promise to Abraham and Sarah. He always intended them for to have a son of their own. They just sort of jumped the gun and tried to help God along when he really didn't need that help. So when they are very, very, very old, Abraham's over 100, Sarah is over 90 years old. 
um, these visitors come and tell Sarah that within a year she will have a son of her own. And she laughs because she's old and she's never been pregnant before, so why would they think now it would happen? But that's exactly what happened. God lives up to his promise. She becomes pregnant and she gives birth to a son and God tells them to name him Isaac. And Isaac means God laughs. And that is that, that, that name kind of comes from the idea that Sarah just sort of laughed off this idea that she would ever be pregnant. But now we have this problem. We have Abraham who loves both of his sons, um, but we have Hagar who is resentful. She had the first son and usually the first son is the one that gets all of the blessings and all of the inheritance and gets all of the good stuff. Um, but Sarah is the one, is his wife. Hagar's not really his wife. And so Sarah believes that Isaac should be the one that gets all the blessings because he's, in her eyes, um, Abraham's true son because she is his wife, even though he's younger. And through all of this, God has um, told Abraham and Sarah that their son, their son together will be the son um, that will lead to this great nation. And in the end, that's what happens. God says, and says to Hagar, um, she, they, Hagar and Sarah are not, do not like each other. They, as you can imagine, there's a lot of conflict there. And eventually God sends Hagar away. But one of the things that he says to her, to Hagar, is, um, oh, shoot. He says, sorry, I had to get the right verse. He says, the matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son, meaning that, that Hagar and Sarah were not getting along. And so this bothered Abraham because he loved Ishmael. He loved him as because he was his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be so distressed about the boy and your maidservant. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you to do, because it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the maidservant, mainly Ishmael, um, into a nation also because he is your offspring. So that's from Genesis 21, 11, and 13. And eventually they split. Hagar and Ishmael go off. And if we go back, um, Ishmael, they actually go down to Arabia. And it is the Arabs, the Arab line, everybody who is um, Arab today traces their roots back to Ishmael and Abraham and through Hagar. And everybody who's Jewish who's, who um, are, you know, a part of the, are, uh, follow Judaism, um, come from the line of Isaac um, through Abraham with Sarah. So that line on the side where it goes through Hagar, that is where Ar Arabs come from. And eventually Islam comes from that line. And with Sarah and Isaac, that from that line comes Judaism. So let's talk about Judaism first. Um, all of our Old Testament are, is scripture that belong to the Jewish people. Christianity comes out of Judaism. We have a very tight relationship with them. Um, but there are some, di obviously, differences. The biggest difference is Jews do not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They don't believe he was God's son. They do not believe he is the promised one that God had promised to the Jews to come and set them free. Um, they are still waiting for that Messiah. So right now, today, there are three different divisions of Judaism, Orthodox Jews, Conservative Jews, and Reformed Jews. And you can think of them sort of as different denominations in Christianity. In Christianity, we have, you know, Catholicism, Baptist, Methodist, and all of that. Judaism has just broken down into smaller groups, and each of those divisions believe something a little bit different. Orthodox Jews are the ones who are most strict. Um, you may have seen movies or been in neighborhoods where they're Orthodox Jews and the men have the, the curls and women um, cover their hair with wigs. They have very conservative dress. On the Sabbath, they won't drive a car. They won't do any work. So you see them walking to temple and back. Um, when I lived in Maryland, I lived in a neighborhood very close to an Orthodox neighborhood and it was really remarkable to see how they stuck to these laws um, the covenantal laws um, that came through Abraham so Orthodox Jews are the most um, faithful to the original Jewish texts that we know of the Talmud and the Torah and um, all of those ancient writings 
conservative Jews um, are a little less um, strict when it comes to how they follow the law. And Reform Jews actually are the most liberal of the three different groups. Um, Reform Jews are very, um, have a very interesting belief system too because they don't even believe in the resurrection of the dead. They don't expect that a Messiah to come. They don't think that that, they don't believe, they don't aren't waiting for the Messiah to come. They just um, have a different sort of set of ideas of what Judaism is. All three belong very strongly in the Jewish traditions. When you talk, when, um, you know, circumcision, um, bar mitzvahs, you guys probably have been invited to some bar or bar mitzvah parties. Um, that is very important. Um, following all the high holy days, Rosh Hashanah, um, Yom Kippur, um, Hanukkah, those things, following those traditions that come out of that religion are very important to most Jews, but actual beliefs in following the tenets that were set up way back in the day of Abraham and way back in the day of Moses has lost a little bit of relevance or importance to um, some Jews, especially Reformed Jews. So Jews today focus on deeds. Good deeds can, can atone for bad deeds, not necessarily in the way that karma does, but um, not too similar. If you ha do a lot of good things, it kind of knocks out some of the bad things you do. They also believe that you have to have an authenticity when you repent or when that if you've done something wrong to feel bad about it, that's very important to Jews too. Um, for a lot of Jews, especially Orthodox Jews, the covenant that was made with Abraham is still in place. And it is that idea that he will become, that the Jews will become a great nation. In some ways, they already are a great nation. They are considered God's chosen people. They are the people that God chose to show the rest of the world who he is and what a relationship with him looks like. Of course, we know that gets, um, that that gets expanded when we come to Jesus. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But a lot of Jews still believe that that promise that they are his chosen people remain intact. And if you are a Jew, you cling to that, that God sees you as his chosen people. You are special in God's eyes. And a lot of that comes from the Old Testament. All right, so let's talk about Islam. Let's talk about that whole line with Ishmael. So what happens is, Ishmael and Hagar go to, to um, Arabia and, and they start multiple, you know, they, Ishmael has children and, and this, this line of Arabs come from them. Um, Islam doesn't get started until 500 years after Jesus. And it gets started by a man named Muhammad. And uh, Muhammad comes and he um, starts dis putting together um, this religion um, and he refer, he calls it Islam. Um, people who follow Islam are called Muslims. There are five pillars of Islam. Um, there is a declaration of faith. If you say um, there is no God but Allah, which is the God, um, that, that's how they refer to God as Allah. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad has, is his prophet. Um, if you say that and you authentically truly believe it down in your heart of hearts, that is one of the the five pillars of Islam, and that is one of the most important things you can do to, to say that you are gonna become a Muslim, is to make that public declaration. In some ways, it's very similar to when we say, I believe in Jesus, I give my life to Jesus, I believe he's the son of God and he will forgive me of my sins, and because of his work on the cross, I will have eternal life. It's that same sort of statement of faith, only theirs is different, theirs says, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad, Muhammad is his prophet. Um, to live up to all the expectations of Islam, you are to pray five times a day. If you live in a place where Islam is prevalent, they have the call to prayers out of the minarets. Um, you fast during Ramadan, which is a time, a month long um, celebration, and you don't eat from sun up to sundown, but then you can eat when it's dark. Um, you have to tithe. Usually it ends up being a 2.5% tithe, but it's this um, giving of charity to people who are in need. And then the last one is sometime in your life, if you are a Muslim, you are expected to make a pilgrimage to Mecca, which is where um, Muhammad began the religion. So those are the five pillars of Islam, what you have to do to be a good um, Muslim. For um, Muslims, the Quran is the definitive and final revelation of God. And what happened is Muhammad, um, during his life, 
kept having these visions and the angel Gabriel came to him and told him all, uh, you know, all about God and all the things that man needed to know about God. And he, those things were written down and that became the Quran. So in some ways it's very similar to our Bible, but in a lot of ways, the Quran is even more um, valuable and holy than our Bible is to the Muslims, the Quran is. They believe if you wanna know who God is, that you go to the Quran. And they, even the physical um, books of the Quran are considered to be incredibly holy. And, and whatever the Quran says is how, is how you should behave. Um, some interesting things about the Quran is Jesus is mentioned in the Quran. Um, he is seen as a, a great prophet and a great teacher. They obviously don't believe that he was God's son, but they um, believe that he existed and he lived. Because Muhammad came after Jesus, that's why he is included in that in the historical timeline. Um, but the Quran is the um, um, essence of what it is to be Muslim. And Muhammad is important because that's who the Quran was revealed to. That's why he has such a high place in their religion. Muhammad never claims to be God. He never claims to be a deity. He just claims to be the one that God chose to reveal himself to so that the Quran could be created. Um, and, and Muslims believe that God forgives us when we sins. They do count good deeds in favor to help, um, uh, you know, shift that balance. If you do more good deeds than bad good deeds, God sees that as a good thing. All right, so that's sort of Islam in um, a little bit of a nutshell. All right, oh uh, yeah, Muhammad is God's true prophet because that's who um, he, the, he revealed the Quran to. All right, so let's talk about Christianity. This is gonna feel a little weird because I know you guys know what Christianity is, but let's kind of summarize it similar to how we're summarizing all these other religions. As Christians, we believe that it's in Jesus that we have this definitive revelation of God. I have said over and over and over that the Bible is what we need for salvation. And if we want to understand who God is, um, we look to the Bible and all of that is very true. But if we really want to understand who God is, we look to Jesus and his life. And we know about his life because it is in the New Testament of our Bible. But Jesus is the one. Remember, he is fully human and fully divine. So he shows us who God is. If we want to know how God would react in a situation, we look to what Jesus did. We look and we see Jesus loving those who are unlovable, um, fighting for those who are disenfranchised. We see Jesus loving, um, but encouraging people to stop sinning. And then we see his ultimate um, act of sacrifice on the cross as his ultimate show of his love for us, taking all of our sin, being that Passover lamb, which comes out of the Jewish tradition, um, and taking all of our sin on him. So in God's eyes, we can be seen as holy and perfect the way God, the, the way Jesus is. So whereas the Quran is the definition of, you know, is how they know who God is in, in Islam, it's through Jesus that we know who God is as Christians. All right, Christianity is the only religion where the creator God enters into his creation. I, this is one of those things that kind of can blow your mind, but it is something that is so important. And it's this idea that God created everything. Um, in the book of John, it talks about how he created everything through Jesus. Jesus was a part of that creation. And yet he humbled himself to leave heaven, to leave the, the um, just, immenseness of his deity of being God and became man, limited himself to become a man so that not only we could relate to him better, but he could relate to us better. Everything that we feel, everything that we've experienced, every emotion, every difficulty we come across, Jesus has experienced that too. All right, Christianity is also the only religion where we don't need to work for our salvation. And I think to me, this is the most key uh, the, the biggest distinction between Christianity and all other religions. And all the other religions we've talked about, you have to do good things, and it's your good things that you do that make um, help you achieve salvation or achieve perfection or whatever it is. 
But in Christianity, we don't have to do anything. The only thing we have to do is believe that Jesus is who he says he is. We have to believe that authentically. We have to leave it, believe it deep down in our bones. But that is the only thing we have to do. And that is because of God's grace, right? The grace that I talked about a few weeks ago, God is always reaching out to us. God through Jesus on the cross gives us justifying grace. And then we have sanctifying grace where God helps us become the people he wants us to be. But all of those are gifts that he gives us. We don't have to do anything to earn that. We just have to say yes to him. Now, not to, I don't want to confuse people because doing good things is part of being a Christian, right? We're told that we should be kind to others and give to the needy and look out for the disenfranchised. That's all part of what we're to do as Christians. But we don't do that as a way to earn God's love or to earn God's acceptance. We do those works as a response to what God has done for us through Jesus. When we believe who Jesus is, when we understand and accept and believe that he is God's son, and it is through his death on the cross and his resurrection that we will have eternal life, our natural inclination is to go out and do good things so other people will know about Jesus. The work and the good things we do is not to earn our salvation. It's in response to the salvation that we get that we do all of those good things. So a kind of a subtle difference, but one that's really, really important. All right, so we've looked at all of these different religions. All of them may have some truth in them, but not all of them can be true. And I talked about that a little bit um, at the beginning. Here's the chart again. I just want you to see by far Christians, well, not by far, Christians are the greatest percentage um, religion of the global population. Muslims are growing very, very quickly though. Um, here is just a little chart. If you want me to send this to you, I can, but it's just uh, a summary of all the different religions. Um, actually, I'm not going to talk about this too much because I don't want to wrap this up. So when we get to who God is, we have to believe that he is who he says he is. That's one of the key factors in this. In Exodus, Moses, um, God's talking to Moses and he says, go tell the people about me, you know, go tell them that I am their God. And, and Moses says, who do I call you? What do I tell them? What's your name? And he says, I am who I am. And the reason I include this verse in here is because there may be some things in the Christian religion that make you uncomfortable. There may be things that you don't understand. There may be things that you don't think are fair, but God is who he is. And we have to accept him as he is um, I think when we do that, he gives us insight. He helps us understand um, that he really is very loving and kind and wonderful, all those things. Um, but we can't make him into who we want him to be. God is who he is, and you have to accept him that way. All right, one last thing as we get to the end of this. In John 4, 16, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And um, I believe this statement to be true, that Jesus is the way to eternal life. He is the way to have a full relationship with God. Some Christians, some denominations look at this and, or some people can look at this quote and think that it is very exclusive. I and mean, what do we say about all those people who are Hindus or Buddhists or Muslims or even atheists who have really good hearts, but just don't believe in God? Does this verse leave them out? Some people believe that it, do, it does. There are some Christians who believe that if you do not believe in Jesus, if you do not have that relationship with him before you die, then you are out of luck. You've had your chance to accept him and you rejected him and that's the way it is. There are other people who feel a little bit differently. And I think one way you can interpret this verse is the idea that Jesus is the way, but that we shouldn't limit Jesus on who he is going to allow um, into heaven or to have a relationship with him. That he is the way, the truth, and the life. To be able to ha get to heaven and have eternal life, it has to be through Jesus. But I don't like the idea of limiting what God can do. God is the only one who knows everybody's heart. And I um, tend to think that 
Um, there may be people out there who may not profess to be Christians, who may not say that they believe in Jesus, but have a heart that um, goes after God um, just in a way that's more, more unorthodox than we do. Remember way back with Abraham, Abraham's faith was, was um, credited to him as righteousness, even though he didn't, you know, he didn't even know who Jesus was, but it was just this faith and this commitment to God that, that God said, I'm going to credit you righteousness. And I don't believe that our God has changed. So I also think that it's possible that there are people out there that Jesus will offer his um, path to heaven to, even though in this life, it may not seem like that is an opportunity for them. I know that sounds a little, that might stretch. And if you don't believe that, that is okay. But um, I have heard Arthur say over and over again, I think we're all going to be surprised at who we see in heaven with us. And I, to me, that is, that speaks to that idea that, that it, God knows our hearts and he, he, ha, he's God. He can allow anybody in heaven that he wants to. They have to come through Jesus to do that but who he offers that to and in what, what way he offers that to is really up to him. He has that authority to do that. Here's another verse that kind of speaks to this. And John, Jesus says, I have sheep that don't belong in this pen. I must lead them too. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. And some people interpret this verse as meaning that, you know, we have Christians, we have people who believe in Jesus and they're one flock. And there may be this other group that we don't understand or don't know how God has touched them, but that Jesus is going to lead them into um, heaven as well, because God loves everybody. God wants everybody to come to repentance. So the idea that he would limit that um, is, um, I, I don't know. I, I, now, that doesn't mean that everybody goes to heaven. I'm not trying to say that everybody goes to heaven. If you're bad and evil and ugly and you don't love God and you reject God, I, you will not, that person will not be in heaven. But if a person is good and has done things that God wants to credit to them as righteousness, he has every right to do that being God. Adam Hamilton is the pastor of the largest Methodist church. Um, it's called Church of the Resurrection. It's in Kansas City. He wrote a book on world religions, and these, this is one of his quotes from it. And I think that he really um, summarizes what I've been trying to stumble through here. I've maintained the traditional Christian view that Jesus Christ is God's only son, the Savior, and God's definitive word, while at the same time raising the possibility that God's grace could be extended to those of other faiths who, in the words of Micah, seek to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. God may look at, look at the people of other religions and, based upon their faith, extend the salvation of Christ to them, even when they did not have the opportunity to know or receive Christ. Um, I think that's a quote um, that you guys come back to that, read it again. Um, it's a challenging quote. It's a, it's something that I, as this is the kind of thing as confirmants I want you guys to do is to think about um, what that means. And do you think people of other religions will have an opportunity to be in heaven because Jesus is extended to them in some way or another? Um, something to talk about with your family. All right. So that is it. That is um, um, our our little two-week study on world religions and can um, only one religion be true. I believe that, that Jesus is the definitive word of God. He is the definitive example of who God is. I believe that it is through him that we come to saving faith. What, two of the reasons I believe that is because he's the only God who entered into his creation, and it's the only faith that you don't have to work for that you just have to receive the gift. Grace is such a huge piece of what Christianity is, and I think it just is so different than every other that um, it makes sense that a God loves us, who loves us so much, wouldn't expect us to have to earn it on our own, but would just give it to us as a gift. All we have to do is say yes. All right, I just realized I did not pray before I started, so I'm gonna pray now and we'll finish up. Father God, thank you so much. 
um, for whoever is listening to this, Father, I pray that you will touch their hearts, that you will make maybe some things that are muddy and confused a little bit clearer. I pray that if they have things they don't understand, they will reach out to me, they will reach out to Michael, they'll reach out to Arthur um, to try to answer or figure out um, what it is. And in some ways, Lord, I pray that you would help them to be okay not knowing. You are God and we are not. Um, we will never be able to understand you completely until we are with you in heaven. And even then, there may be some mystery still um, to you. But I just pray that you help them get to a place where they can feel a sense of peace. And mostly, Lord, I want them to understand just how unique and important Jesus is and how they, what their response to him is, whether they believe in him or not has such long-term eternal consequences that I pray they will take those decisions um, seriously. I thank you and I praise you. And I just um, ask blessings on all who are watching. I ask these things in Jesus name. Amen. All right, you guys, that is it for this week. If you can go to Lighthouse, that would be great. If not, I hope you stay healthy, keep wearing those masks and go wash your hands. All right. Bye y'all. Where are you?